Peter Little, you'll probably all know, um, specialises in civil law, common law area. Before going to the bar, he was a lecturer in contract law, tort law, property law, and international law, whatever that might be, um, at Melbourne University. Baker McKenzie in litigation section. Um, he's an excellent property barrister, and as you'll see shortly, knows his patch. So Peter will now address you on the damages question. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks a lot for coming, on, coming across this morning. Um, it's a pleasure to speak with you. I have an interest in damages, um, only because I don't know enough of it, and I want to know more. And um, in this particular area, being damages for a breach of a sale of land contract, we, we do it a lot. Um, but I just, I have a feeling I just don't know it well enough. So one way to learn it is to give a presentation. But what was interesting was I thought there would be this library of information out there that I would just pull out a couple of cases and study it up and away it goes. But in fact, there's, there's not much. I had to go to a lot of cases in New South Wales to really get the principles and the depth that I was wanting and, and hope to um, get a good understanding. So what I decided to do is explore damages in this area, and, and obviously given the time I can only touch on a few things, but also just have a discussion, if not an insight, on what's happening in this area, especially with these standard clauses in a contract. And, and what I want to do is really just focus on three areas. One is the, the notice requirement and the standards standard contract. Two is really vendors losses and three this interest component uh, and that's all I have time for. Um, any principle, any point that I'm going to refer to is all in the paper. So you, you, all cases and everything you don't have to take any notes, you can take the paper away. Um, uh, but I'm happy and I'd encourage anyone to add to what I see as more of a discussion than, than a lecture of your experiences and insights as well. So, we're in a situation where there's been a, a breach of a sale of contract. The contract's been terminated. We've used the successful rescission notices and the question is, what are our losses? So we turn to the contract and we turn to the standard clauses of stand, the general conditions 25 to 28. But the first thing we always must do is go to the special conditions of the contract. Now this is starting to grow into an area unto itself because what's happening in the special conditions is people are affecting the damages and the losses that you're entitled to in the general conditions. So let me, let me just read out one by way of an example. Now, um, a, a, as you're all familiar with, the, the interest rate in the general conditions is 2% above the penalty interest rate. But what I'm seeing a lot in the special conditions are clauses like this. Uh, general condition 26 of the contract of real estate, general conditions shall not apply to this contract. Instead, if the purchaser defaults in payment of any money due under this contract, then interest at a rate of 4% higher than the rate for the time being fixed under Section 2 of the Penalty Interest Rate 1983, computed upon the money overdue during the period of default shall be paid by the purchaser to the vendor without the necessity of a demand and without prejudice to any other rights or remedies of the vendor. So I understand what they're trying to do, um, and that's well written in my view, uh, and they're increasing their interest rates from two to four, but it gets into complications. So that's my first point. You, you've got to go to the special conditions, and, and uh, as Mitch spoke about earlier, he, he was saying in the, in the old days you may only need to refer to three sections with a rescission notice. In many ways, you, you have to study the whole contract from clause one right through to the end of the clause of special conditions. So, but let's, let's go back and we're at what is general condition 25, and, and this is what it says. Uh, a party who breaches this contract must pay the other party on demand 
compensation for any reasonably foreseeable loss to the other party resulting from the breach and any interest due under this contract as a result of the breach. So the first point I want to identify is, well, that's a starting point, it's a compensatory loss. So the court's more inclined to have a sort of reliance type of damages, but an overemphasis of compensatory losses. Except for interest. Interest seems to sit out there on its own and it's quite happy to have a very high interest rate. But we ask the question, well, when do you determine what is the foreseeable loss? And it's reasonable foreseeable loss. Obviously, the corollary question is, uh, what is it? But the first question is, well, when do you determine what are reasonable foreseeable losses? Well, this is normally determined at the time of entering into the contract. Now, <coughs> General Condition 25 talks about reasonable foreseeable losses, but it allows us also to look at consequential losses. And therefore, you can ask, at what point in time do you determine consequential losses? Well, it's the same time. So at the time of entering into the contract, and you go, oh, okay, that's great. What does that mean? What it means is if you're a vendor and there are some consequences that may occur if the purchaser does not go ahead to settlement, it may be prudent to identify them at the time of entering into the contract. So therefore you have a clear argument to go to the court and say, these were my foreseeable losses. You've written it down, you've identified them. And in fact, in the same contract that I took you to earlier, they have another clause. And this clause says, once again, under special conditions, general condition 25 of the contract of real estate, general conditions, shall not apply. I'll pause there for a moment. We've got a special condition clause overriding a general condition clause and saying it does not apply. Now, the first point that I think of, well, this is getting into a complicated area because in these contracts, they, don't, they no longer specify how one is to interpret special conditions relative to general conditions. We've got the general principles and we know what they are, but the contract is, doesn't say anything about it. So I naturally think, well, what if you haven't got someone who's written a special condition clause well, and, and then you're into a clumsy area, dare I say, ambiguous area, that you have conflicting rights between a special condition and a general condition. So, um, that's one thing you have to watch out for. But in this case, it says, shall not apply to the contract. Instead, the vendor gives notice to the purchaser that in the event that the purchaser fails to complete the purchase of the property on the due date under the contract, the vendor will or may suffer the following losses and expenses which the purchaser would be required to pay in addition to interest chargeable on the balance of purchase money in accordance with the terms of the contract. A, the costs of obtaining bridging finance to complete the vendor's purchase of another property. Interest charge on such bridging finance. B, interest payable by the vendor on an existing mortgage under the property calculated from a due data settlement. Three, accommodation, any removals and storage necessary to incur the vendor and it, and it goes on. And, and, and what the author of this special condition has done is gone through the previous case law in this area, identified where these costs can be um, not foreseeable, where the courts in the past have not allowed these as appropriate damages, and has put it as a special condition and saying, I, the vendor, are putting you, the purchaser, on notice at the start, at the time of entering into the contract, that these are my, at least, notable foreseeable um, losses. So um, from one perspective, if someone was to ask me what to do, that's what I would do. Um, uh, therefore, that becomes a foreseeable loss. So, um, uh, but we still ask the question, uh, what is 
a foreseeable loss, putting aside special conditions. Now, in Castle Constructions, Price Limited versus uh, Fagala, uh, his honour in that case said, um, it is, it is not po it's not possible to construct a bright line test to specify the contracting party's reasonable supposed contemplation as a probable result of the breach. And McHugh in Alexander and Cambridge Credit Corporation also spoke about what is or where is the line of what is a reasonable foreseeable loss. And he said, the test is whether the loss claim was reasonably supposed to have been in the contemplation of both parties as, not un, as, not, as a not unlikely result. Got to love double negatives in our game not unlikely result of the breach. Now, I'm not sure whether that makes things any clearer, but um, that's the current law and that's why I'm having difficulty finding case principles in this area to identify what is reasonable foreseeable loss in the situation. But uh, let's, let's move on. So obviously the question is, when we talk about what is a loss, we're talking about the scope and the extent and that will depend upon the unique factors in your case. Now, um, I'm going to say something which I'll say a couple of times. Um, we no longer have legislation. This contract is purely contract principles. And so therefore, the other contract principles apply. And it, it always has, but this is more of an em emphasis. So if the vendor is seeking damages, the vendor must have be, or must be in a position to be ready, willing and able to perform the contract at the time uh, that he or she terminates the contract. Um, now, I haven't seen a case where we're able to overturn that. I've tried to argue that for the purchaser on one or two occasions, but we've never got the smoking gun to assist us with that. But also the general limitations apply. And these general limitations are dealing with causation and remoteness. So to succeed for damages in common law, the onus is on the party alleging the breach to establish a sufficient connection between the breach and the loss suffered. In one case I looked at, the damages went over for three years and the court in that case um, said uh, the losses in the third year were uh, um, uh, too remote and there was also uh, a break in the connection. But causation can be established in one or two ways. If it can be proved that the but for the other parties breached, the alleged party would have not suffered the loss and damage, or the other party's breach is so connected with the alleging party's loss or damage that the matter in its ordinary common sense and expertise, it should be regarded as the cause of it. Remoteness is the test in Hadley and Baxendale. It's the two-limb process. Uh, uh, damages will, be, will, not be, will not be too remote if it may be reasonably considered that as a result that arising naturally according to the usual course of things from the breach, it's the first limb, and the second limb to have been reasonably in the contemplation of the parties at the time they made the contract as a probable result. Now once again, they're pretty general, but uh, um, these, will, these arguments will be raised a lot more because we're just going back to the contract law principles to be applied rather than legislation. Now, let me move on to my next point in talking about serving of notices. The general condition requires us to serve uh, notice. If you wish to take advantage of the rights in the contract, and, and I'm, I'm just going to read a couple of the paragraphs of the general condition. So, paragraph 27.1 and I'm at paragraph 18 of the paper, a party is not entitled to exercise any rights arising from the other party's default other than the right to receive interest and the right to sue for money owing until the other party is served and fails to comply with a written default notice. So obviously there needs to be a default notice, but default notice is actually not defined in the contract, and I've gone to my legal dictionary, it's not defined there. 
So arguably it's anything in writing where there's some form of a default, but I'll, I'll speak more about that. Obviously a rescission notice is a default notice, but not all default notices are obviously rescission notices. My, my point with, is, is by saying that is you'll have a situation and you, I'd invite you to consider to issue a default notice and not a rescission notice. And the purpose is to activate your penalty interest rates. Uh, and that may be a good return as you work out what needs to be done as well. Uh, and um, uh, it, it doesn't add as a cutoff and you still have the opportunity of putting another default notice or even a rescission notice at a particular point in time. But I would apply the same principles that Jackie's spoken about with a, def with a default notice, that is give it reasonable time, not to terminate obviously, it's just to recognise that there is a default. You need to clearly define what the default is and how they are to remedy the default. And it just could be um, a, a simple point. But note that, that this section triggers, it's a triggering mechanism for you to take advantage of what is, um, one can say, the liquidated damages component. I, I make um, a, another comment that in General Condition 27.1, it uses the clause, fails to comply. Now, once again, this is not defined. Uh, what do we mean by fails to comply? Later on, uh, under 29.1, there's a definition of a default not remedied. But I, I would submit to you that fails to comply is different to default not remedied. Um, and so uh, let me give you perhaps uh, an example, a fail to comply, the compliance can be dealt with by um, the definition you use in your notice, your default notice. Um, and, and further, uh, in what is general condition 29, I'll be arguing that in there they define the default as something which is different to interest and costs. In a rescission notice, and Jackie, I'd be interested in, in Georgie and, and Mitch, I'd be interested to know your views, but my view is in a rescission notice, the def default that needs to be remedied is not only what triggered the, the rescission notice, but also costs and interest. But under general condition 29.1, uh, it identifies the default and it talks about interest and costs differently. Let me just read out 29.1. Thank you. All unpaid money under the contract becomes immediately payable to the vendor if the default has been made by the purchaser and is not remedied and the cost and interests are not paid. 29.1 seems to suggest the default is different to costs and interest, but in a rescission notice, I would define that the, the, the default, they have to remedy the whole default, and the whole default is the original reason for the rescission notice, together with interest and costs, and if they don't pay everything, then the contract's terminated. Um, arguably, if you have a different definition of default, one party could pay just the costs, and that could be said to be enough that the default doesn't fall over. So, to me, there's some sort of inconsistencies in the structure of some of these terms. Now, I'll move on to what is an important general, uh, general condition, and it's general condition 29.4, and this is, this is the key, key paragraph. Uh, it's on page seven of my paper, um, but the first point is, it says, if the contract ends by a default notice given by the vendor, the deposit up to 10% of the price is forfeited to the vendor as the vendor's absolute property, whether the deposit has been paid or not. Interesting, it says up to 10%. What does that mean? So a deposit up to 10%. Obviously, it can't be more than 10%. That's not my, 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 not my point. But if the contract says the deposit is X dollars, which works out to be 5%, but in the standard form contract, in the relevant 
particulars of sales, it, it has a dollar figure which is by calculation 5%, there's an argument to say that that's all that's required. Uh, th that's grey area. I mean, I haven't seen a case that spe clearly specifies the, the incorrect interpretation that if you only get paid 5% and, and in the remedy, in the de um, um, deposit section of the particulars it only has 5% that you are allowed to go greater than that. I mean, you can, you can be in the norm, this is obviously set up for the position that the deposit's 10% but you've only been paid the 5%, then there's no question you can get the extra 5 but it depends on what's written into the contract. Now, um, I'm just going to move on to Vendor's loss and just touch on one or two particular points. So we've done with notices, Vendor's uh, losses. Now this is a situation where uh, the purchaser didn't settle and in fact the rescission notice has been granted and, and the contract's terminated and the Vendor has then resold the property. And at paragraph 29, the, the Vendor's loss uh, was said to be assessed by reference to the difference in the value, if any, of the subject property at the date of the breach compared to the contract price that the vendor would have received on that date. So under General Condition 29.4, you're allowed to elect, uh, if, you, if you sell the property within 12 months, allowed to elect to get the difference on the sale value of the property. But, but the but how you value that, in, in you, you can, the breach can occur on 4th of October 2012, you sell the property six months later, you've got to have the value as of today. Now what the courts do is the courts say, well, we will take the value of the property six months later when you sold it, to be the market value as of today. So it's, it's the difference between the contract price and the market value of the property at the date it was terminated. But the courts take, well, we'll accept as a market value of the current date of the property um, as being when you actually do sell it. But you've got to be careful. So um, you're allowed to leave it at least 12 months there's an interpretation, does that mean 12 months, that means settlement? I would say the 12 months would be the date of signing the contract, not settlement. Uh, uh, but it can be 12 months out and you may have to get a valuation of the contract at the date it was terminated, which means an expert, and this is for a vendor, which means extra costs. Um, I referred to a particular case in there, which is um, Palsty and uh, Palaby at paragraph 30, which explains in a practical term what I've just illustrated. The final point that I want to deal with is interest, penalty interest and interest um, that is a penalty. Um, arguably the, the, the general condition 26 in the standard form contract deals with interest and this is, for want of a better word, liquidated damages. It's a form of a liquidated damages. So the principles apply for a liquidated damages meaning that at some particular point in time, interest rates can be so high that they are in fact a penalty. Um, so that what I'm seeing in these special conditions and the one I've read out to you increased it up to 4% higher than the penalty rate. But, but it may just keep continuing, so be careful that if you do do something like that and you go too far, that it could end up to be a penalty and therefore not enforceable. And how you structure that extra interest rate in your special conditions will determine whether you can then fall back and still use the 2% in your general conditions. If you don't structure the clause well, I would submit that both the, the clause dealing with the gen interest in the general clause and the special conditions um, are just um, so confusing that the court may uh, allow none of it. So um, um, I'll just finish with one point, uh, and that is uh, um, uh, one other, just, just the final point. What we're going to see that hasn't occurred previously as well, I think, is the interpretation of these contracts. You're going to have to look at what is a reasonable person in the position of one of the parties. You go back to your basic principles, and um, Georgie referred that into a case, which is U108 versus Van Singh. 
where the um, relevant parties went in and interpreted exactly who are the people who are interpreting the contract. So um, w we haven't seen that in previous times, but I think that will come in more when you're interpreting uh, these forms of standard contracts in relation to damages. I'm sorry I've run out of time, but thank you very much. I invite Peter to stay there um, because George has had some exposure to questions, so Peter can stay there. What about some questions? We've got another 10 minutes or, or thereabouts. Um, someone can run to the microphone if we need to, but otherwise... Th we'll be thanks, Pat. Uh, just a mathematical uh, question of sort of damages might be easy for me to understand. You had a sale price now of a million dollars on a contract, a 10% deposit's been paid, the purchaser defaults rescission notice, there isn't any, it's one of our rescission notices, so there's no problems and it goes through, um, and then the 100,000 deposits forfeited, and the property's now worth 800. Does, does the vendor have to resell, or can they sue for the hundred, extra $100,000? The, the, the question, uh, no. The vendor does not have to resell. The vendor can decide what he or she wishes to do. If the vendor wishes to apply or utilise the rights or the particular uh, general condition in the contract, which is 29.4, I think, then they have to make a, an election which way to go. But your general common law damages apply <coughs> notwithstanding the standard form of contract or whether you adhere to that or not. So in simple terms that they, um, even though that 29 falls in the contract, it's still open for the vendor and the example I gave to say at the day I rescinded, um, I'll take you 100,000, the property's now worth 200,000 less, I'm 100,000 so they can still sue for the $100,000. In my view the answer is yes to that, um, but you've got to get your evidence. Um, and what I mean by that is you've got to get an expert to come in and say, right now, the property's in fact worth 200. Uh, but you are doing what 29.4 allows you to do anyway. And, and just after you've had an argument and the property, might, they argue you can't do that in the courts and it's now worth 1.2 million, that's just good luck to the vendor. <laughs> well, 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 that's right, but you, you, someone will be suing the valuer. If you've got an expert, expert value is given a valuation of 800 and turns out not to be right, someone's going to be sued. Oh, no, I was more talking about a recovery in the marketplace by the time you get to court in two years' time that it actually has gone back up to 1.2. Yes, well, well, well that's right. I mean, that, that's, that's one defence. I know, um, and I'll diverge for a moment, uh, I was having a chat with Mitch earlier and uh, at least one magistrate was interpreting that particular contract quite strictly and saying, in fact, am I right to say that the contract had to be finished or settled, the second contract settled or just signed within the 12-month period if you apply it? And, it? and if you hadn't done it within the 12 months, you cannot apply that clause. But in my view, there's, you're open to the common law damages approach. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yep. Any other questions? Uh, there's been no mention of GST, uh, which I'm not sure if that's uh, <laughs> an intention. Um, rescission notices with GST in it, are they faulty where there's no tax invoice being served, given that usually, and this is a situation where we say uh, it's full GST applies, and then you've got issues about when's taxable supply. So you've got issues where, whether it's a valid rescission. Two... Um, from the point of view, if the contract's terminated, uh, the damages, where, how does G GST play a part? Um, this is probably to any of the speakers. Well, I think it's to everybody here as well. Um, obviously, I've got to do my caveat and say I'm not a tax expert and I know enough to know about tax to never to talk about it. Um, and there's no, there's no, it's a deliberate reason why there's nothing about GST in there. <coughs> The, the, but what I do know is um, um, in, in relation to rescission notices where there's GST, one of the questions is, has there been a tax invoice or something issued by that stage? Um, and, and that's a critical question to what extent, therefore, you can insert that into a rescission notice. Now, I've seen rescission notices with X dollars plus GST written that way uh, as, as a, an appropriate rescission notice. 
Now, in that scenario that I've been involved with, that hasn't been questioned and we haven't gone to court on it. I, I don't know anything um, outside that or above that um, and I haven't given any advice in that and if something like that comes to my desk, I refer it to it, but I, I'm open to the others who may know something more about that. I'll just mention that um, I know what Associate Justice Mokhtar does. If you look at that case that Georgie mentioned of Damco and Moxham, um, the question arose whether the default was a failure to pay the balance of purchase money or the failure to pay the balance of purchase money plus GST. And then if there was a default and therefore nothing got paid, therefore there'd be no GST and deposits would be forfeited. The answer, I think, is contained in Peter's comments, which he's um, made and which George has made. If your notice specifies the default, then the default is usually a failure to pay both the, de the, the balance of the purchase money and the GST payable if it's called up. And you're at risk if you don't say plus the GST because one of the tests that um, has been mentioned is the purchaser's got to know what they have to do to remedy the breach. And if GST is payable and you don't call for it, you might be in trouble. But um, Mukta had uh, a bit to say about that too, so that's worth having a look at. And um, top question. I'll, I'll just stick with that. What about in these um, cases where the special conditions particularise all of the foreseeable losses? Interest then can that be deemed to be a penalty? And the question for those at the back is, if in special conditions you have almost all foreseeable events that may occur, uh, does interest then become a foreseeable interest, a foreseeable event? Is that, have I got it? Yes, I guess, is, is it a penalty because it's, it's um, foreseeable that there will be damage? All your other losses are covered. Mm. Um, well, uh, typical legal answer, yes and no. Interest, you can have the penalty, and go back to it. You have liquidated damages of the penalty that you're able to get from general conditions. In addition to that, and alternatively, you may have, by way of damages or losses, interest that you've had to pay pursuant to perhaps a mortgage or refinancing. And so that's a different sort of interest. Um, and prima facie, your interest for your mortgage that you pay because the purchaser has not fulfilled his or her requirements to settle or for refinancing, there's not a general principle say you're automatically entitled to that. You go back to your fundamental principles. So when you talk about interest costs in special conditions, you need to say what exactly are they? Is it these other forms of interest or are you talking about increasing your penalty rate interest up to some higher level um, but, but, but that's um, only relating to another section or, or general condition 27 and not the losses. I think, looking at the time, we've just got time to thank the speakers for what they've done. Can I um, just tell you before we do that formally that um, the Green Library is available um, there are papers there, there are videos there, and there are things from a wide range of people. Peter's got one there, this will be there with Georgie, uh, there's the character thing for myself and Bill Stark and other people. So uh, there's a lot of resources there and Michael Gwen makes this available. Um, would you thank the speakers, Peter Little and Georgina Costello.